Today we're going to talk about two different stories of resurrection. And for our opening prayer, we're going to use a poem that John Updike wrote in 1960. Some of you may or may not know that uh, Updike was an Episcopalian. Uh, he actually uh, lived um, up on the North Shore and attended St. John's Beverly Farms um, quite regularly. Uh, if you know uh, Ann Stevenson, who served here, um, her husband, Tad Meyer, is also a priest. And uh, uh, Tad was um, the rector for John Updike and buried John uh, when John died. So um, uh, this um, has a very particular theology. If you've already heard Rainey's sermon about the, the physicality of the risen Jesus and uh, the bot embodiedness of Jesus, um, this poem actually goes very well with that. So we're going to pray it together. This is not a complicated poem. <laughs> uh, you know, some poems you think, oh my gosh, what's going on here? This is pretty clear. So um, I hope you'll pray it with me. Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecule remit. The amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers, each soft spring recurrent. It was not as his spirit in the mouths and fumbled eyes of the eleven apostles. It was as his flesh, ours. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, paused, and then regathered out of enduring might, new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back, not paper mache not a stone in a story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse for each of us the wide light of day. And if we have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel, weighty with Max Planck's quanta, vivid with hair, opaque in the dawn light, robed in real linen, Spun on a definite loom. Let us not seek to make it less monstrous for our own convenience, our own sense of beauty. Lest awakened in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by remonstrance. Wonderful to be a poet. <laughs> So we're talking today about two stories with a, a kind of quick look first at uh, a third. And the two stories we'll spend the most time on are uh, Jesus appearing as a stranger to two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then Jesus appearing as a stranger on the beach, uh, in the story that I like to call the fish fry on the beach. So as a kind of uh, prologue, let me say that in almost all of the stories of the resurrection, Jesus appears either at dawn or at dusk or nighttime. I don't think that this is by chance. Think about what your eyes are like and how you see when you first wake up in the morning, or how you see when the sun's beginning to set or at night. Things look different. It's not the bright, full light of noon. It's a different kind of light. It's light. You really do see things. But it's different. I wonder whether the evangelists were trying to say to us, we need to see with different kinds of eyes when we see resurrection. Don't expect resurrection to look just like the full light of bright noon. It might be a little subtler, a bit more mysterious, but real, like the reality of things that happen at dawn 
or dusk or in the night. And so Jesus keeps being um, not seen at first in these stories. If you go and read one resurrection story after another, many times they just don't recognize him. Now, there are lots of ways to understand that besides light. Another way to think about it is that, in fact, he went through some kind of transformation. He doesn't look the same anymore. Maybe you know what that's like. We go through transformations, yes? Have you ever met somebody after something important happens to them and they really look different? I think the one that we most often talk about is pregnant women who look different, not just because they're swelling in front, but there's something different about their faces. Something is changing. Well, it's not just pregnant women who look different when, when they're being transformed. I think everyone looks a little different when transformed. And if you're expecting the person who was, you might not recognize this person. So Jesus is a transformed Jesus. He's resurrected. He's got new life. And he appears to disciples over and over again. The first one that we're going to glance at, and I haven't given you this text, I'm just going to read you a, a slight bit of the story, is from uh, the 20th chapter of John, where he appears in a garden to Mary Magdalene. So let me read you um, a part of that story. If you have a Bible with you, this is John 20, starting at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said, don't hold on to me. Better translated, don't hold me back. Because I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. In John's Gospel, she is the first evangelist of the resurrection. Our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, who in some things are very conservative, in this are much more liberal than we are in the West. They call her an apostle. In fact, they call her the Apostle to the Apostles. Mary Magdalene. But notice that she doesn't recognize him until he speaks her name. He's spoken already, but it's not the voice. It's something about the way he says Mary. Um, I'll be um, a little sappy with you for a moment. Um, I um, went through a terrible event in uh, my sophomore year of college and maintained a stiff upper lip about it until I called my mother on the phone. When I heard her voice say Bill on the other end of the line, I lost it. There is something about hearing a person that you know loves you speak your name <coughs> that isn't quite like anything else. He is known to her in the love that she hears as he speaks her name. 
as in all gospel scenes, you are to imagine yourself as her. He speaks your name with the same kind of love. Two other stories, both of which have strangenesses about them. First, the Emmaus Road story. And you do have this whole story uh, beginning on page three of your handout and um, at the top of page four. First of all, one of the nice things about um, this story is that we don't know where Emmaus is. There are actually several towns outside of uh, Jerusalem that claim to be Emmaus, the Emmaus of this story. I really like that because what it does is free us to imagine that Emmaus is the place you and I are headed when we've lost hope. It's wherever we go when we have given up. And we all have places that we like to go when we give up, right? A safe place, any place but the place of the trauma, some other place. So they're walking away from Jerusalem, which is the center of everything for Jews. One of them is named and the other one isn't. I also like this. Because here, you don't have to use much imagination to imagine yourself as that person, the unnamed one. We don't even know gender. Might have been a woman. But they're leaving. And the story makes it pretty clear that they're leaving because they don't believe in the resurrection. They've heard about it but they don't believe. Maybe uh, this is you sometimes. Um, I hope it won't shock you to, to say, uh, hear me say, it's me sometimes. It is hard to believe in new life sometimes. And a stranger walks up. It's Jesus, but they don't know it's Jesus. And the dramatic tension in the story, as in many stories, is that we, the reader, know it's Jesus and they don't. But there's another dramatic tension. Jesus may not act the way that you expect him to. The first thing that he asks them is just, so what are you talking about? What are you talking about? What do you make of that? The, the evangelist has that be the first question out of Jesus' mouth. Besides advancing the story, <laughs> yeah, I know it works that way, but, but why, why put that question in Jesus' mouth? Rebecca? For me, it familiarizes it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Makes it seem like an everyday kind of thing, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, when you walk up to a conversation at a cocktail party where they're talking, don't you want to know what they're talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> or, you know, if you go into your workplace and two of your coworkers are there talking, you want to know what they're talking about. So it, it does, it familiarizes, it makes it kind of everyday. But it also helps us to know that this Jesus isn't so full of himself that he places his own concern first. He wants to know where they are and what's going on with them. Obviously, he's going to have some important news to tell them. But first, he wants to know what's going on with them. And they're kind of agog that he doesn't know. You've not been paying attention. You've been living under a rock. And don't you know what's going on? Um, and um, they tell him what their hope had been. They own up to their sadness. 
This is not stiff upper lip. It says they stand still looking sad. They're not afraid to show what they're feeling. And then they tell him what they're feeling. If you're wanting to know what they're feeling or what their hope had been, it's in verse 19. And following. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. Here's the hope. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Now, redeem is one of those religious words that you can kind of um, bliss out on and not really know what it means. The Greek word here for redeem means to free from slavery. This is a very down-to-earth word, meaning we hoped he was going to get rid of the Romans. Mm -hmm. We hoped we were going to be free again. You can imagine how dashed their hopes were. <clears throat> And then they go on to say, well, we've heard that he's been raised from the dead, um, but they didn't see him. The people that told this went back to the tomb and said he was alive, but no, we didn't see him. So what's it like when somebody really wants to know what you've been through? What's that like for you? <clears throat> Assuming you're willing to tell. What's it like when somebody tells you? He cares about you. Yeah, he wants to know. He cares. He really cares. He's not keeping himself at a distance. He wants to know what's going on. It's not easy to hear about people's traumas, their lost hopes. I assume many of you, like me, would rather avoid that sometimes. Jesus doesn't avoid it. What do you think it is that lets Jesus listen? Who are the best people to listen to our lost hopes, to our traumas? Who are the people who do that? Those who've been through. Yeah, people who have been through their own kind of trauma. <clears throat> the passion story, the passion, by the way, in Christian theological terms means the whole story, not just Jesus' suffering, but also his resurrection. This whole story is about facing suffering and seeing that it doesn't have to have the last word. But first, you have to face into it. And so Jesus does face into it with them because he's been through it. They're suffering, but he also has suffered. He can listen to their suffering because he didn't refuse his own suffering. Now, for this to make any sense at all, you really have to believe that Jesus was really a human being, not a fake human being. <laughs> this is why the early church argued so much about was Jesus fully human? Because if he wasn't fully human, if it was just a charade there on the cross, then he didn't really know what suffering was like. And he didn't really know what death was like. If he's really human, then he does know. And he can receive your fears, your traumas, your dashed hopes. Um, and he can do that all the way through the moment of your own death, because he's been through the whole thing. So he receives all that from them. Now, one of the things about gospel stories is that they're highly compressed. We don't know how long uh, uh, this walk was. And we don't know 
how long he listened to them about their lack of hope, their dashed hopes, their suffering. Because it goes immediately from his listening to them about that to his saying, well, you're kind of foolish, you know, and slow of heart. Um, we have to be careful with that with each other. <laughs> Not to move too quickly to hope when we're listening to someone else's suffering. They may not be ready for hope yet. <clears throat> to speak to someone about hope before they're ready for it is to re-traumatize them. It's to slap them around and say, get over it. And you may not believe this, but people actually do say that to other people. You mean you're still mourning three months after he died? What's your problem? I've heard people say that, though. Get over it. you got to move on with your life. Wow. Be really careful with that. There will become a time when someone is ready to hear hope. They'll let you know if you listen carefully. I assume there was something in this dialogue that let Jesus know that they were ready to hear something else. First of all, they've hinted that they've heard something hopeful. They just haven't believed it yet, right? They've heard that Jesus has been raised from the dead. So he goes on and he does what I've called here in the outline, reframing their suffering. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to have somebody reframe your suffering? <clears throat> find meaning in it. To help find meaning in it? Yeah. Look at it a different way. To look at it a different way? If you stand here and look dead on at the cross, it looks like a dead body. <coughs> if you stand over here, I'm going to now use Julian of Norwich, one of my favorite saints, and you look in the pierced side, maybe you see something different. She saw a garden. Hmm. I don't know what was she smoking, but... Um, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> reframing means standing in a different place and looking at the thing differently and to see if you can find some meaning in it. I don't know how much time you've spent in proximity to people who have been through a lot of trauma. I don't spend much time that way these days. I used to spend a lot of time with people who were traumatized. Um, but there's an interesting thing about people who survive trauma. Sometimes they're the best ones to help reframe. Because they know what it's like to have to look here, look here, look here, look here, and see if there isn't something other than just the trauma that can be seen. And the fact that they've survived means that somehow they've been able to do that. Usually someone's helped them. So Jesus himself has been through this, right? So he helps them to reframe it. He retells, uh, to use the theological term, salvation history. Um, he retells the history of their people. And says, you know, think about it. And I imagine what he's saying is, remember what Moses did? Remember when we were in slavery in Egypt? Looked pretty hopeless. And then Passover happened. And then we were out in the wilderness, and we didn't have food, and remember what happened? Manna, and quails. And remember, and remember, and remember. And then he ends with himself and says, this is what had to happen to the Messiah. This is God's way. God somehow brings good out of what is absolutely awful 
Notice he doesn't say that it's not awful. And he offers them hope by reframing their hopelessness. He offers them companionship in their suffering. They still don't recognize it. I imagine them kind of scratching their heads, <laughs> saying, hmm, well, maybe. Maybe. See, maybe. Maybe there's hope. It's when they're at table together that something clicks for them. It says that he takes bread, blesses it, and breaks it. And when he does that, they recognize him, and then he disappears. Now, you could say, OK, so they're remembering um, the many times he fed people. They recognize his distinctive way of um, breaking bread, or his distinctive way of blessing, maybe. But I wonder whether it's not just that, but that we let our guard down when we're having dinner in a way that we don't when we're just walking along the road. <clears throat> that when someone is feeding us, we become more vulnerable. Something that we trust is good is happening to us. Food in and of itself is a reminder of hope, right? <clears throat> I wonder whether they began to hope again because he was feeding them. I wonder if they recognized him and his fact of being risen and alive because they found goodness at the table with him. Why does he disappear? Well, one of the problems with religion is idolatry. Now, um, I'm about to say something that may be familiar to you or may not, and you may like it and you may not. But um, it is problematic to idolize Jesus. If you set Jesus up as an idol, then what you do is you let yourself off the hook. Jesus could do all those things, but not me. Jesus was perfect. He was the Son of God. He, of course he could do all those things. I wonder whether he disappeared because it was time now for them to do what he'd been inviting them to do all along. And if he stays, he's in the way. He makes space for them to be transformed now. Now, if you're saying, well, I can't do all the things that Jesus did, you're right, you can't. Not alone. One of the things he transforms us for is to be uh, little Christs. This is what Christian means, right? Little anointed ones. Members of a body that can do things that you and I can't do alone. The church has had many problems down through the centuries, but the church has also done enormous good as a body that no one could have done alone. The church founded the universities of Europe. The church founded the hospitals of Europe. The church founded the only hostels that Europe knew. <coughs> Yeah, the church did lots of awful things. But it did all those things um, trying to follow Christ. Do you think we would have done all those things if, uh, if Jesus had been sitting in Jerusalem perpetually? I don't think so. 
Jesus, come found a hospital. Jesus, come found a university. Can't you set up a hostel, Jesus? So he disappears to make space for us to do what he's called us to do. This is not my way of saying don't have the highest possible devotion to Jesus. It's my way of saying don't idolize him in a way that prevents you from being who he calls you to be. If you see this moment at the meal as a, a, a kind of communion moment, they take him into themselves as they eat. They now bear him into the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing when we take communion. In other words, it's not just for you, right? It's for all those that you encounter this week. And he gets out of the way so that we can do it. Any good thing that you do does this. Small or large. Notice what they do as soon as he leaves. They go and tell others that now they believe. Um, by the way, that matters. This world um, is a place of really dashed hopes, in case you're not noticing these days. And people need uh, to believe that there is a possibility of goodness in life. So the next story, Fish Fry on the Beach. I've shortchanged this second story because if you were here a few weeks ago, I've already talked about this story. Um, but it fits so nicely with the Emmaus Road story as a kind of, um, they kind of mirror each other in certain ways um, that I wanted to put them together. So we're shifting from one gospel, Luke, to another gospel, John. The thing about this gospel uh, and this story is that in the story that you're going to hear this morning, or have already heard, which happens in the chapter right before this, John 20. Jesus breathes on the disciples on Easter Day, and again a week later, which is understood to be their recreation. This is the breath of the Holy Spirit that he's breathing on them. They are being transformed. And he sends them out to forgive. You'll hear that very clearly in this morning's Gospel. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. Um, despite what our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters say about this being um, Jesus commissioning uh, priests to be um, the forgivers of sins, uh, that's absolute balderdash. Um, what he's doing is commissioning the church to forgive and to spread the word forgiveness. It is not something that priests possess, and you don't. You have the power to forgive or not. So he's done that, and he sent them off on the mission to do that. Notice what happens at the beginning of this story. So read with me. Uh, you have the top of page four. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together with Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, sons of Zebedee, and two others. You can see yourself among the two others. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said, we will go with you. They have given up on the mission of forgiveness. They've gone back to being fishermen. Uh, I happen to find this hopeful, uh, since I give up on the mission of forgiveness sometimes too. And what we'll see is that Jesus gives them a chance again, and gives us a chance again. 
So they fish all night and they catch nothing. And when they're coming to shore, they see someone um, in the misty dawn uh, that they don't recognize, but it's Jesus. And it's actually the beloved disciple um, uh, who understands finally that it's Jesus. And he tells Peter, and they come ashore. And, um, but only after Jesus says, well, you know, you didn't catch anything, did you? Why don't you try it on the other side of the boat? Um, and then they bring in so many fish that, uh, the, um, well, they bring a lot of fish. When they arrive, he's already uh, built a charcoal fire with bread and fish on it. This is why I call this the fish fry on the beach. <laughs> Notice that he doesn't wait for them to bring something for the meal. He prepares the meal first. Now, there are lots of ways to understand this, but one of the ways to understand it is that we're in uh, big trouble if we think that we can go out and feed the world without being fed first. This stranger in our midst, um, this Jesus who comes to us, uh, God is trying to feed us in Jesus in all kinds of ways before you ever do anything. Communion is not payment for your being good this week. I hope it's not because I wasn't good this week. <laughs> In fact, most weeks I'm not very good, and I suspect most weeks you're not. Um, communion is fuel. It's the fuel of love. And we're invited to join in the feast and bring our gifts, our small fry, to add to it. Um, but God is the one who provides the feast. And whatever we bring is welcome. Um, by the way, uh, the detail of 153 fish in verse 11. The rabbis believed there were 153 languages. What this is trying to say is the whole world is welcome at this feast. That means, and I know that um, you've heard me say things like this before, that means that if you are a Hillary supporter, Bernie's folks are welcome at the feast. If you're a Trump supporter, I imagine there are Trump supporters in the room, then um, your opponents are welcome at the feast. Everybody's welcome at the feast. Everybody. It's not about being good. It's not about being right. Everybody's welcome at the feast. And we're about to find out how much being right isn't what it's about in the dialogue that happens between Peter and Jesus at the end of the feast. Notice Peter gets fed before the dialogue. So the last conversation that Peter and Jesus had, conversation, Jesus denied Peter, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus was denied by Peter three times. I've given you the citation down at the bottom of page four. Three times while Jesus is on trial, Peter says he doesn't know Jesus. This is his best friend. So now Jesus and Peter have a conversation. Notice Jesus doesn't say anything about the denials directly. He doesn't say, why did you do that? Must have been tempting, huh? <laughs> Instead, he asks Peter. Uh, he asks Peter, "Do you love me?" And I've given you this before, but I just want you to notice that there are two different verbs that are being played with here in this story. When Jesus asks Peter, "Do you love me?" He's using the uh, 
verb that's um, based on the word agape, uh, which means divine, no strings attached, full out, love, love, love. And Peter keeps asking, I, uh, philia, you. <laughs> I love you as a friend. I'm sort of, I, the way I like to translate this, this is, um, I'm fond of you. Hmm. Yeah, I'm fond of you. I, you're my friend. And Jesus asks him a second time, um, do you love me with divine love? And Peter, I think quite honestly says, I'm not up to that. I love you as a friend. I'm fond of you. But the amazing thing is that the last time, Jesus switches. He doesn't drive a knife into Peter. He says, so, are you my friend? He switches the verb that he uses. Now, I don't know about you, but that's sort of the height of love. That's the best you can do. I accept it. I accept that that's the best we can do. And this is forgiveness. Jesus accepts the best we have to offer, however inadequate it might be. Jesus joins us in our failures. Doesn't wait for us to get it all together. And his forgiveness becomes an invitation to try again. I might say that that's the only way I've ever been able to try again when I've flipped it up, is when somebody forgave me and said, well, now why don't you try again? It wasn't when somebody slapped me around that I wanted to try again. So these stories are stories about sharing um, the ups and downs of life and about the reframing of meaning that can happen when we do that and about the opening up that can happen when we share food and forgiveness and the hope that can happen when someone invites us to try again. If your picture of resurrection is different from that, I'd love to hear about your picture of resurrection, but that's my picture. So if you don't believe that I, uh, an updike Jesus stood up and uh, his uh, molecules re -knit, but you believe in this, maybe that's good enough. You start believing in resurrection wherever you are. Uh, and next week, we'll talk about the sacraments that come out of this experience. Because both Eucharist and baptism come out of this experience. By the way, if you're wondering about this picture on the front, this is a Velazquez painting where the Supper of Emmaus is in the background. And you notice who's in the foreground. An African-American maid. No, she's not African-American, she's African-Spanish. And she sees the scene reflected in that bowl. Velazquez understood that story. He understood that that story was for her, <coughs> that she might have been the one walking on the road to Emmaus, or she might have been the unnamed disciples in the boat with Peter in the other story. She gets to participate, and so do you. Thank you.